Like Steve mentioned, I'm Rohit Agarwala. I'm a technical leader in the OpenStack at Cisco team. Um, I've been involved with OpenStack almost since its inception, so it all got started in like 2011. Um, and I've played several roles along these years, uh, including being a OpenStack core community developer, an architect, as well as now an evangelist. Um, so so my, my Git, GitHub account at OpenStack yeah, you typically get a number assigned to yourself. I was 127th member of the OpenStack community, and today we have about 25,000 people who have signed up into, into the OpenStack uh, project itself. Um, so I'm going to keep this uh, session pretty interactive. We're going to talk about upcoming services in OpenStack, um, and these are the services uh, that have been identified by the foundation as official OpenStack projects. Uh, so before I get started, a quick show of hands, who actually knows what OpenStack is? All right, you're in the right session, firstly. Who can tell me? So I have a few USB sticks. Uh, it's a 16 gig USB stick that has uh, instructions for actually getting you started OpenStack on your laptops. Uh, so first question that I want to ask, and if whoever answers me correctly, I'm going to give you a USB stick. Charles here is going to help me out. What is the tool that developers use to get started with OpenStack for their development and unit testing purposes? Anybody? No, you, not you guys. Anybody? Else? Dev? There you go. Dev packs. No, not you. He, he got it right. Ah. So, yeah, so you get a USB stick that has a DevStack man lab guide. So we did a training on Saturday uh, with a bunch of folks uh, that actually helped them get started on their laptop uh, to run DevStack. So it has a virtual machine image. You can boot it up and play with that in your environment. So um, I'm going to ask a few more questions. And if you ask a question, Charles is also going to give you a USB stick as well. So definitely make sure you ask a few questions in the session. So the agenda here is I'm going to quickly give you a very high-level overview of what OpenStack is. Uh, we'll go through the project governance structure that's enabling a lot of the new projects to come into OpenStack. Uh, and then I'm going to discuss five new projects. So this will be Trove, uh, Sahara, Congress, uh, Magnum, and Ironic. So again, when we go through the session, I'll provide details for each of these services. So what is OpenStack? OpenStack is your cloud computing platform for building your private as well as your public clouds. So who here has used Amazon? And probably have VMware in their environment running a private cloud. So OpenStack is not really a substitute for that, but it enables you to deploy a certain set of independent and interrelated services. And your tenants or your administrators can basically perform, REST a perform CRUD operations using the REST APIs that these services expose. So, excuse me. So here you can see I have compute, networking, and storage as three services that, I, that I've shown. And these are running on your standard hardware. Uh, and your tenants or your applications, they use the API to communicate with these services that virtualize the cloud for your tenants as well as your administrators. Uh, now again, there are, there are certain design tenets that each of these services have been built upon. Uh, so these include, for example, being multi-tenant. So if you have uh, a multi-tenant cloud, for each of these services, they have their own REST APIs that they can basically uh, uh, hit upon the API and perform the CRUD operations against the hardware. Now, these OpenStack uh, includes, uh, in addition to compute, networking, storage, these other set of 20 services. Uh, these are the services that have been officially recognized by the foundation. Uh, so the foundation ensures uh, that the projects that have a good community, that have a good number of contributors involved, uh, that come into the OpenStack's foundation or the big tent, uh, as we call it. So here in the left, you can see I have uh, identified the infrastructure as, as so infrastructure as a service-based projects. So who here can tell me what are the two projects with, with OpenStack started? Two projects. One was contributed by NASA and the other was by Rackspace. Anybody? Okay. Okay, you go. Compute and network? One's right, one's wrong. 
compute and object storage. He's got it right. So Nova, Nova, which is the compute project, uh, and Swift, which is the object storage. So uh, OpenStack started with these two projects, and NASA and Rackspace contributed these. And this was back in 2011. And now what, you have, what we have seen is a bunch of other services that have come up. Uh, and so we have Neutron, which is the networking service, and we have a lot of talks during the, uh, during the event that will actually go into many more details of how Neutron works and what are the different integrations that we have Cisco uh, solutions. Uh, the projects in blue are kind of the services that support these infrastructure-based projects. Uh, so Keystone, which is a multi-tenant identity service. So for your authentication and authorization purposes, Keystone provides that uh, capability. And then uh, the, on the orange, you have uh, higher level services such as Strobe. Uh, this is a database service that we're going to talk about. Uh, Sahara, which is an elastic data processing, so enabling you to deploy your Hadoop clusters. Um, and then policy for policy congress. Again, so these are the services that are making use of the infrastructure level services for some of their purposes. Uh, so we'll see, see in Trove, for instance, that they spin up instances within Nova on which you actually can configure and build your databases. Um, so let me now give a quick uh, overview of the OpenStack project governance structure. Um, so again, OpenStack is an open source project, and it has certain guidelines against which it identifies certain projects. So any, any pro new project typically starts being hosted externally in the community. It, it starts outside of the OpenStack Big Ten. Uh, you gather the community folks who can contribute, get the main core part of the project stood up. Uh, you make, make sure that it exposes REST APIs that your tenants and administrators can use. And once it has kind of built up a core mass, you can submit it into incubation. Uh, so incubation is basically where the foundation or the technical committee reviews the project to see well, whether it is ready to be accepted into the, into the technical committee. Uh, and if it, is, if it is, then it actually goes through the integration learning cycle where the OpenStack includes it in every six-month release cycle. So OpenStack follows a six-month release cadence where all of the projects basically have a design summit uh, and they decide what features that they're going to be implementing in the next few months. And then after the release, after the end of the six months, they come out with their own release for every project. Uh, again, if they're not ready, they go back into the incubation where they discuss, again, make sure that the requirements that are laid by the technical committee are met. For the most part, this worked up until the Juno release, which was the last OpenStack release. Uh, so OpenStack releases are codenamed alphabetically. Uh, so we had Juno, and then the latest release was called Kilo. Uh, but this latter approach kind of prevented innovation to happen in the community. Uh, it kind of created a political minefield, actually, for people to come up with just new projects and get recognition instead of actually developing the project itself. Uh, so some of the reforms uh, that the technical committee has provided in order to bring more services into the OpenStack Big Ten is actually removing the incubated and the in integrated uh, release process. Uh, so now you can actually have tags. So as an end user, uh, you can read those tags and understand better what that OpenStack project is capable of doing. So, so going forward, you will have tags, for the example, for the Nova project, you can have tags how stable it is, uh, whether it is security hardened or not. So using these tags, you can actually select the services that you want to deploy in your environment, and that will basically enable you to get what you want out of OpenStack. Because like I mentioned, in OpenStack, we have a lot of services that perform infrastructure as a service as well as pass functionality, and ensuring that the, you select the right services that you want in your environment is very critical for you to be successful with OpenStack. So now let's, uh, what I'm going to do in the next few sections is going to discuss some of the new services that I mentioned, like Trove, uh, Magnum, Congress, as well as Ironic, which is a bare metal service. Uh, so I'm going to provide some of the technical details of these services, as well as the APIs that they expose. Uh, so the first service is Trove, which is database as a service. Um, so Trove provides a configuration or provides an API for your tenants within OpenStack that you can actually install and configure databases within your instances. Uh, so, you can, so Trove uses Nova to spin up a virtual machine instance within your cloud, and it installs a database that you configure as your backend uh, within the Trove service. 
Um, so the, on the right, you can see there are a few management, uh, there are a few APIs that I have listed along with the functionality that they provide. So from a management perspective, you can actually select the flavor uh, of the instance of the Trove instance in which your database is going to be installed. So it provides you that flexibility in terms of what is that virtual machine, how that virtual machine should look like uh, for the database to run. Uh, it's again a single tenant database per Nova instance, so you cannot have multiple uh, different tenants databases running on the same instance because we want to have multi-tenancy and want to have a secure deployment. Uh, from a data store point of view, uh, you you can have both uh, 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 you can have both relational as well as non-relational databases. Uh, so again, Tro Trove architecture follows a back plugin model, so you can have different plugins that can actually install these databases. Uh, so we have support, for example, MySQL uh, and PostgreSQL, SQL, and from a no, uh, from a NoSQL perspective, you have Cassandra, MongoDB, uh, as well as Couchbase and Redis uh, as backend implementations for deploying your OpenStack. Uh, or your tenant databases. Uh, now, if you wanted to configure these databases using the APIs itself, uh, Trove provides you that capability. So we have a concept of configuration groups. Uh, so you can actually specify like how, what is the maximum number of database connections that you will have for your database instance using this API. Uh, the security model makes sure that you can actually not SSH directly into the instance because we don't want uh, other tenants to be able to get into your database instance. So that is why enabling these configuration groups enable only the tenants to use uh, for configuring the database. Uh, and then some of the production features, such as backups, uh, replication, as well as clustering. Uh, once you deploy these tenant databases, you want to make sure you are able to replicate your data uh, as well as clustering so that you can distribute your data acro across different shards. Uh, again, uh, within Trova, shards is basically a, 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 a combination or a set of three member replica sets, and this is today supported with MongoDB. Uh, so once you hit a query server, you can actually distribute the data across three of your Trova instances. Um, then we have integration with some of the other projects, and some of the companies that are involved here include HP, Tesora, and including Cisco. So we are providing integration uh, uh, in the community to improve the Trove database uh, service. From an architecture point of view, uh, I guess the heart of the Trove architecture is uh, the task manager. So this is, this is the control plane tool that actually spins up the instances within the instance. Uh, and in the instance, you have a guest agent that is responsible for getting all of the uh, API requests and configuring the database uh, accordingly. We also have the conductor service at the bottom. Uh, so when you are actually retrieving some of the information from the main SQL database that's running on your controller service, it's going through that conductor service. So you are actually not accessing the main database of your OpenStack service directly. Uh, you're using the conductor service to, to access that. Um, what else? Yeah, so conductor, the other responsibility of the conductor service is for heartbeats and backup and restore. Uh, so when you have, like for example, in, in backup case, you have another instance that's running and you're replicating in that backup instance, the control plane ensures, or the uh, conductor ensures that the backup instance is up and running, uh, and when it goes down, it, it provides that not notification back to your tenant. So that's about Trove. Um, the next service I want to talk about is Sahara. Question here is, what backend implementation, any backend implementation that you can give me example of Sahara, or any big data platform that you have been using in your environment? I do, correct. So, so Sahara is exactly that service that actually enables you to uh, cluster and manage Hadoop clusters. Uh, now, you, you may be doing that with bare metal servers, uh, but in OpenStack, you can now actually use the virtual machines to deploy your Hadoop cluster. Uh, so it, uh, Sahara provides two functionality. One is installation of your Hadoop cluster and then actually executing jobs on those Hadoop clusters that you have provisioned on the virtual machines. Uh, so we'll have APIs for both of them. Uh, what I want to first do is talk about the Hadoop provisioning aspect of it, that is creating of your Hadoop cluster itself. Uh, so it exposes these set of APIs. The first one is new node group templates. Uh, so here we define uh, what are the Hadoop processes that should be running in each of your 
instances that you are going to be deploying within your OpenStack cloud. So you can actually select uh, for example, later I talk about anti-affinity groups. So you can specify, well, these are my two Hadoop instances, and they should be running only the worker nodes, and this should be the one that should be running, for example, my job tracker service. Uh, so there is an, uh, within the Horizon dashboard, which is the graphical user interface, you can select, uh, well, I want to enable anti-affinity, and I want these services to be running on only these instances. Uh, Cluster templates, so this defines how many of your nodes, the cardinality uh, of your worker nodes or your job tracker nodes. So, so you can specify how many instances would I be spinning up within my Nova Cloud uh, for my Hadoop cluster. Again, you can see here the power that the APIs provide because as a tenant, you can now define these using the REST APIs. You can specify your cluster templates, the number of nodes that should be part of your cluster, uh, all using the APIs. And finally, the cluster itself. So as a tenant, when you, once you have defined your node group templates, once you have defined the cluster template, you can click on saying, this is my cluster, and that would eventually send requests to Nova to spin up those uh, virtual machine instances. And using the backend implementation that you have configured within Sahara, uh, those instances will automatically be configured with the appropriate backend implementation that you have. So it could be a Hadoop implementation, it could be a MapReduce or a Cloud Spark or a Clouder or a Spark uh, backend implementation that's, that's getting configured on these instances. Um, so once you have uh, your Hadoop cluster up and running, you want to now execute jobs on them, right? Uh, you, you have a script that you have created using a job processing script, for example, Hive or Pig or, or MapReduce, and now you want to point to that script such that the Hadoop cluster get, get, can pick up that data, execute the script, and then store the data. Uh, now the advantage running all of this within OpenStack is that you can use OpenStack Swift object storage to actually store the output of all the processing that happens. Uh, so again, a very good example of how a higher level service is making use of both Nova as well as Swift to perform some of the operations. Uh, so from an API point of view, uh, the data source here you can specify where you would be picking up all of your, uh, st uh, where you'd be picking up your jobs from. Uh, the job binaries provide you additional dependencies that you may have for, for, the, for, the, for the script that you're going to be running uh, your jobs with. And finally, the jobs is actually the, the execution of the binaries as well as the script that you have provided in your, uh, in your APIs. Uh, and the job execution is deploying all of the scripts onto the Hadoop cluster that you just created in the previous step. Um, so on the right, you can see from an from a, from a architecture point of view, uh, the Elastic Data Processing component here, EDP, uh, communicates with the virtual machine instances as well as with Swift in order to spin up the instances as well as to store the data. So the next service is Congress. Uh, so this is policy as a service. How many folks here require, have some sort of uh, policy in their data centers with OpenStack? Or how many folks here have deployed OpenStack in their data centers? One, two, okay. Uh, well, so you certainly have some sort of policy or role-based access control also defined. What Congress enables you is to provide a compliance or a policy framework for all of your OpenStack services. Uh, so it actually retrieves all of this information from the, from the services themselves using the API that it exposes. Uh, and the tenants can actually define a set of rules uh, that, it, that you want your services to follow. So once you retrieve that information using the REST API, it matches with the requirements that you have specified in the policy table. And if there is something that does not match or does not accurately reflect the policy that you have defined, it puts that in the error state and takes the appropriate action for that tenant using the REST API as well. So it is a framework that's enabling to ensure that your OpenStack-based cloud is actually be being in a policy-compliant state. Uh, now, in order to do that, there are different policy, uh, 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 different policy uh, models that are supported. So the first one is classification. Uh, so this is the standard one where something, uh, if your policy is not matching, it puts it up in the error table. So it has an error table to match uh, the existing state with the state in which your cloud is running. 
the enforcement is that you are taking certain actions, and we'll go into a few details of what actions you can take in order to make sure that your policy is running consistently. Uh, and then access control. So this enables only certain users to take actions uh, within your OpenStack cloud based upon how your cloud uh, behaves if the policy, if the cloud is out of out of sync with your policy defined. Uh, so from an enforcement point of view, like I said, this is the action that you would take once a policy is not in a compliant state. And these include being proactive. Uh, so you can actually define these policies in advance uh, so that in case if something goes wrong, goes wrong you, can, you can take the action. A good example of this is uh, on the top right corner where you want to make sure that every network VM that is connected is either on a private or a public cloud and is owned by the same tenant owner. So in case if your VM is connected to a network that's defined by another tenant network, uh, th that policy will not be met and you would be unplugging that VM from that network. So this is the kind of action that you can actually enable through, through Congress. Uh, reactive, again, a very good example that I just said is reactive model where you are taking actions based upon how your cloud reacts when your tenants perform certain actions. Uh, interactive, this is where you can actually, as, as being users of the cloud, you come into the picture and you take certain actions on the cloud rather than relying on the framework itself to take actions to make sure that the cloud runs in a policy compliant way. And then assistive uh, is where you are getting some information from users as well as using the model itself to make sure uh, that the policies are compliant within, within your, uh, within, with, with all of your services. Um, from an API point of view, like I said, you, you have capabilities for your tenants to define the policies, uh, the policy rules, as well as the actions that they should be taking when, when the policies are not met. Uh, primarily driven by companies like VMware, HP, and Huawei, uh, from Cisco, we have a lot of different policy efforts that are ongoing, and we are trying to make sure that we have a good overlap uh, with this framework as well. So our group-based policy effort that we incubated in the community that is based upon the application-centric infrastructure, uh, we are providing integration with the Congress framework so that you can actually use Congress uh, to, to send requests to the group-based policy uh, APIs uh, that tenants use uh, so that your networking application policy that you have defined are compliant in your OpenStack cloud as well. Um, so the next and the last, or the second last service I'm going to talk about is containers. Uh, who here can name me another container service in OpenStack apart from Magnum? Sorry, what's that? I couldn't hear you. Docker, that's not an OpenStack project. I want to I want name an a OpenStack project that deals with containers, apart from Magnum. Did I hear an answer? Well, well the other one is Cola. Uh, so Cola enables containerization of your OpenStack services. Uh, so Magnum, on the other hand, is actually providing you the APIs uh, to uh, as resources for your tenants to spin up containers. Uh, so you know, Docker uh, is a good example of a, of a, of a service uh, that you can use to actually spin up containers. Uh, and then LXC is another example. So uh, what Magnum provides you is an orchestration services, uh, and you can have different backend implementations using Docker or LXC to spin up these containers. Uh, and what in addition to APIs, it also provides you the resources or the infrastructure that you need for provisioning these containers. Uh, there's actually another talk tomorrow or on Wednesday that will go in a lot of more details on both Cola and Magnum. Uh, but a good example of using the OpenStack service here is like Nova. So what Magnum does is it provisions uh, the VM instances using Nova APIs, and then it basically spins up the containers within that Nova instance. Uh, so, so in the picture, you can see that Magnum is acting as a, like a glue layer that it talks both to the Nova endpoint to Docker endpoint as well as with Kubernetes endpoints. So we are also providing integration with Kubernetes where it maps the APIs that we are, or the resources that we define within Magnum and we map that into the Kubernetes requests. So things like base or pods or service endpoints so that your different containers can communicate with each other. Uh, we have that plugin within Magnum that can basically hit the Kubernetes endpoint so that your container environment is all set up. Um, 
Today, we are doing this with virtual machines or using Nova. Uh, going forward, we will also uh, enable this integration with uh, Ironic, which is the bare metal server provisioning in OpenStack. I'll, I'll discuss how Ironic also works. Uh, but you can basically, using the Ironic driver within Magnum, uh, create a bare metal server and then uh, spin up containers on your bare metal server. So as a tenant, you don't have to think about provisioning the infrastructure that is required for you to spin up your containers. Um, I talked about the resources, very much similar to what Kubernetes points out. These are, again, resources that are, we are providing for tenants in OpenStack. Um, since I have only a few minutes left, uh, this is the last service that I'm going to talk about, uh, which is Ironic. So this is the bare metal server uh, provisioning. Um, uh, to give my Cisco pitch here, we do have integration with our UCS servers. Who here is using Cisco UCS servers in their environment? Awesome. So you can actually now use Ironic to integrate with UCS. Uh, we have the integration with the Fabric Interconnect. Uh, so using the service profiles, you can actually communicate using the Ironic driver uh, so that you can power, power, uh, power provision your servers as well as do uh, a lot more operations. Um, so let me provide some context into what Ironic does from a REST API point of view. Uh, so you can actually define all of your nodes uh, within, using, use, within the Ironic service using the REST APIs. Uh, so within the so, uh, configuration file, uh, for example, for, for UCS case, you can specify the service profiles uh, that the Ironic service needs to retrieve, uh, so it will map those service profiles into the physical host that it is associated with. Um, from an architecture point of view, we have, uh, just like in Trove, land, we had conductor, we have the ironic conductor here, uh, which communicates uh, with the service itself, uh, so you don't have to directly access the database to retrieve all of your node information. Um, then initially, we have a Python agent that, that gets booted up, uh, so this is needed only in the initial part so that uh, the, the Pixie boot happens as well as the initial TFT boot to get the initial image uh, is done with this agent. Uh, once the server actually boots up, this agent is uh, brought down and you don't need this agent anymore. Now, in order to enable very uh, smooth integration, uh, Nova, which is the compute for instances, we have also provided an Ironic driver so that you can use the Nova APIs to send in, uh, requests to the Ironic service. Uh, Ironic itself provides REST APIs, but now you can actually use the Nova API itself uh, for, bo for both bare, uh, virtual machine provisioning as well as for bare metal provisioning. Uh, so a single API enables both virtual as well as uh, uh, physical host uh, provision. Uh, I spoke about the use of reference uh, open uh, technologies for the, for the reference implementation. So this includes DHCP, TFTP, as well as Pixie boot uh, to get all of the information that it needs in the initial boot up time. Um, the APIs finally uh, include such as chassis and drivers and the uh, links that you need, uh, how your uh, physical infrastructure is laid out. All these can be defined using the tenant APIs. Uh, so as you can see in summary, uh, what I want to capture here is that as tenants or as users of OpenStack Cloud, uh, you have a lot of APIs that now you have in your hands to provision the infrastructure that you need. Uh, from a database point of view, you don't actually now need to manually install the infrastructure and configure the database uh, by yourself. You can use the tenant APIs that OpenStack provides uh, and enable that in your environment or for your applications that you are running. Uh, similarly, the Ironic service, now you can use tenant APIs as tenant users uh, to come up with a bare metal server for your uh, application workload rather than going through a ticketing system uh, where you have to wait for several weeks to actually get a bare metal server. Uh, so the OpenStack ecosystem is growing. Uh, it's bringing more, more and more advanced services, including higher level services into the ecosystem. And you as developers and users can actually be part of the community by contributing into these services uh, because they are just getting started. Um, so I would now probably have a minute or so, and I'm free to ask or have any questions that answer any questions that people might have here. And if you ask a question, you get a USB stick as well. Any questions? Just curious, how stable is OpenStack for production quality deployments? Define stable or production, either of those. Well, uh, I mean, so 
till the Kilo release, we had a bunch of uh, projects or services uh, that the community released. And uh, you know, just to give you an example of how hardened the code is, every commit within OpenStack goes through a CI/CD process, and there are several thousand of test uh, regression tests that the community runs through. So that's from a code point of view that we are making sure that the quality of code within the community is just not that anybody can just push in any patch that they want. It gets code reviewed by core community members of the project itself, and, and, they, and, and they make sure that the code is, is strong and stable. Uh, from a deployment point of view, again, there are several distribution vendors like Red Hat and Canonical and Mirantis that actually are picking up these services and enabling the, the deployment within your environment. Uh, from Cisco point of view, we have a solution for your private cloud deployments, such as Cisco OpenStack Private Cloud, uh, which we enable you to build your private clouds using all done remotely, uh, so you can build, operate, as well as support your private cloud using Cisco, uh, using Cisco as a vendor. Um, and again, that's a very stable environment. Uh, so you need to basically, my point here is that work with a vendor that actually knows what OpenStack is and they can support your OpenStack cloud. Uh, unless you have a set of experts within your uh, team itself, I wouldn't recommend a single person team trying to run a stable OpenStack production cloud. I know a long answer, but it needed that. Rohit, thank you very much. We've run out of time, All right. unfortunately. I'll be, I'll be around for answering any other questions and giving out sticks. Thanks, guys. That's great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, one more thing. Uh, just. Uh, we have a developer.cisco.com slash OpenStack site. Uh, there's a lot of information there in terms of what plugins and drivers that we integrate with Cisco. Uh, so I highly encourage folks to go and check this out. It's developer.cisco.com slash OpenStack.